Guys, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for this chance to be gathered in your house, to sing your praises, to lift up our prayers, to hear from your word. Father, your word is a challenging word today because it, it teaches us clearly that you want us to be fruitful, that it's, it's not acceptable to you just to continue in our sinfulness. And so, Father, we're great at excuses. We love making up reasons. And, uh, Father, we need your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit to, to get us to get rid of those things that would hinder us from hearing you. Help us, Father, when we hear from your word today, help us, Father, not to look at the speck in our neighbor's eye. That's so tempting. It's so comforting. Help us not to do that. Help us, Father, to take a good long look in the mirror and see the log in our own eye. And help us, Father, to acknowledge that it's there and admit that we need your help to remove it and trust that you will do that. So speak to us today, Father, through your word, by the work of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. Guys, we're going to start with Luke chapter 13, verse 9. This is uh, from Jesus' parable. These are words spoken by the the vine dresser uh, in the parable. Luke 13, verse 9. The vine dresser replies, if it, that's this fruit tree, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. And our sermon for today is titled, Tomorrow's Sins. So let me ask you, what does it mean to repent? Does it mean to simply say, I'm sorry, you ever get one of those? <laughs> I'm sorry, right? No, I think it's a little deeper than that. Um, does it mean simply to be sorry? No, repenting means more than just even being sorry. Now, certainly we should be remorseful over our sins, and we definitely need to admit that we have sinned. Scripture teaches us plainly in 1 John chapter 1, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean to repent? See, actually... In Scripture, what God means when he teaches us to repent, what God means is he wants us to change our mind. So the focus of repenting, the idea of repenting in Scripture, is not primarily about what you did wrong or didn't do that you could have done. The idea of repenting is not about in the past. It, it does cover that, that is needed, But the idea of repenting in Scripture really has to do with changing your mind and changing your mind about what you're going to be doing going forward. So one sort of visual you might have in your your mind about what repenting is, is repenting is kind of like this. You're facing in the wrong direction. You're walking in the wrong direction. You're thinking and talking in the wrong direction. But then you repent. And what that means scripturally again is that then you have a change of mind. The change of mind produces a change of heart, a change of life, a change of action, and then you turn 180 degrees in the exact opposite direction. But you do not plant your feet here. You do not remain here. No, having turned, then you begin to walk in this new direction. That's the idea in Scripture behind repenting. 
So when you repent of something, you are literally changing your mind about what you were planning to do. Now, Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, which we were just covering today in our new members class. Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from sin. And he teaches this because on our own, pursuing our own priorities, tomorrow we will willingly and joyfully run headlong into sin. We will enjoy it. We'll probably encourage others to participate in it. And we will most definitely try to escape any of the consequences of it. When we let ourselves lead us, we are headed straight towards sin. Which is why John the Baptist says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I baptize you with water for a reason. For repentance is what he says. I baptize you with water unto, for, so that you will be a repenting people. Again, that you will have a change of mind and you will continually understand the need to change your mind about how you look at things. You see, baptism is meant to produce new fruit, fruit of the Holy Spirit in someone's life. And so you need to honestly examine your heart and ask yourself, what sin am I likely to do tomorrow? As you think about your schedule, even right now, as you think about your schedule tomorrow, and you think about what meetings you have lined up, and what people you're going to be interacting with, and what sort of projects will probably be coming your way. As you think about all these things that your tomorrow looks like it will be, you need to ask yourself, in, in, in these conversations, in these relationships, where will I likely be tempted to sin? Maybe it's cheating on your midterm, or maybe it's cheating on your wife. Maybe it's spreading gossip about a coworker, or maybe it's stealing from the shareholders. Maybe it's playing sick so you can get out of a responsibility, or maybe it's saying you're capable of providing a good or service that you know good and well you don't have the foggiest idea of how to perform. This is why the baptism which Jesus gives to the church to give to the world is a baptism with the Holy Spirit and with his fire. Fire burns things. Fire consumes things. Only the Holy Spirit can produce good works in us. This is true. But make no mistake about it, you bear a responsibility in this because only we can decide not to do them tomorrow or today. You know, we can't decide about what happened yesterday. Our decisions regarding yesterday are already done. And so that's why repenting is not primarily about yesterday, although that's, that's easier for us to deal with if we just think about what we did wrong yesterday, not having to address how we're going to be different tomorrow. But see, repenting is not just uh, about what happened yesterday. It's not, we, we can't change our mind about what happened yesterday. All we can change our mind about, our priorities, is for today and every second that follows the present one. God does not lead us into temptation. He delivers us from evil. And this is really a good thing because our natural fallen minds are at enmity towards God. God's ways are not our ways. We read in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world. Now listen, please. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. 
How? How, Jim? How are we going to be transferred? Oh, guess what? God's Word tells us. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And we read from the 23rd Psalm, He guides me into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And from the very first psalm, we hear these words. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. See, he's like a tree planted by streams of living water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. We must be on our guard because in addition to the sins that we can already imagine that will be tempting us on Monday when we go to work or on Monday when we enjoy our retirement, there will certainly also be unexpected temptations that will come up. But we cannot continue tomorrow in our sins from today. And these are hard words that Jesus says. But he repeats himself. That means he probably wants us to, to pay attention. So listen to Jesus again. Jesus says, unless you repent, Unless you change your mind, you will all likewise perish. These are strong words. And he repeats it in verse 5, literally and verbatim. Unless you repent, unless you change your mind, you will all likewise perish. And it's after Jesus has repeated himself twice that he then teaches this parable to illustrate his point. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came seeking fruit on it, but found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, but I find none. Cut it down. Those are hard words. Cut it down down why should it use up the ground the vine dresser answered the master sir let it alone this year also until i dig around it and put manure on top then if it should bear fruit next year well and good but if not you can cut it down so what does this fruit look like that Jesus wants us to bear? What is this fruit that wrestles against the natural sinfulness that our human nature wants to produce? Well, of course, we go to Galatians chapter 5, and we, we read about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I have to confess to you as a preacher, it is, a, it is such a, a nice passage to preach. Because we talk about, this is what the Holy Spirit wants to produce in you. These nine fruit. And then some, uh, some uh, theologian comes along and will remind you, well, it's not nine fruit. It's in the singular. It's one fruit. That's well and good. There's still nine characteristics to that one fruit then. So we're just going to talk about the nine fruit, if that's okay with everybody. So those nine fruit are commonly translated as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and well, that last one might not be so easy, self-control. I mean, honestly, at 11 o'clock at night when you're hungry, self-control is kind of hard, right? But those are generally pretty easy to talk about. And as a preacher, love preaching about it. But here's the thing. I'm going to be honest with you. The verses before that that talk about the works of the flesh, they're not so easy to talk about. Because they're very confrontational. It's kind of like Jesus being confrontational in his parable for today. And when you look at the words that talk about the works of the flesh beforehand, you're going to see that the works of the flesh are in opposition 
to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the thing that you and I struggle with as Christians is this temptation to tell ourselves, well, we can have both. I can do the works of the flesh, and I can have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, that is not the case. And if you have made that decision, you've made the wrong decision, and you are giving ground over to the works of the flesh. Listen to Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 16, which says this, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. There's no peaceful coexistence here. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are self-evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who persist in these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, it's as Luther said 500 years ago, roughly, you and I are like a horse that has two riders on its back. One is Satan, and the other is our Savior. And both of them are fighting with each other to get controls of the reins of your life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we need to listen to the final words here from Galatians 5. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. See, one of the things that we need to, to understand about the Christian faith is this simple sentence. Salvation produces sanctification. Let me say it again. Salvation produces sanctification. So what is salvation? Salvation is the work of God to bring us into a right relationship with him. And how does he do this? He does this through the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit uses the word of God. Faith comes through hearing. The Holy Spirit uses baptism. Uh, baptism now saves you. So the Holy Spirit works and gives us faith. And then he grows us in our faith. And so then salvation produces sanctification. And what is sanctification? Sanctification is this coming more and more into the image of Christ. Salvation produces sanctification when God works in you. Where God is not at work in you, it isn't because of God. Daily repentance and changing your mind to be more like Christ is the refining like silver seven times in the Holy Spirit's fire. See, God is a jealous God. He doesn't want just 10%. He wants all of you. And he wants all of it. See, some, some Christians think, well, you know, if I, if I give God a tithe, if I give God 10%, God will be happy with that. He better be. That's more than most people give. True, a lot of Christians think that way. But, you know, God doesn't want 10%. God wants 100%. He wants 100% of your decisions regarding your finances to glorify him. He wants exactly 100% of the way you spend your time to glorify him. He wants precisely 100% of the words that come out of your mouth to be words that are glorifying and honoring to him. He wants 100% of your emotions to reflect joy and trust and hope in him. Hope in him. 
He doesn't want 10%. He wants it all. He wants 100%. And you and I, we should take that as a huge compliment, that God wants all of us. And not only does he want all of us, God does whatever it takes because he made you in his image. And he wants nothing less than to restore you to his image. See, God isn't like a cheap date who promises you the moon but gives you a moon pie. God hung the stars in their place and he has prepared an eternal home for you. God doesn't have a junk drawer anywhere in heaven. No, the buildings and the very streets themselves are made out of gold. There's a good reason why people in heaven rejoice, because it's perfect there. And so with an eye towards the future, God says to you and I today, Be ye holy, as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep all of our hearts and all of our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.